now that it's all finished, we could just say it's good to be back home yeah. and good to see you guys again. Um, yeah, just we feel that pressure many of you are under in terms of emotional pressure. We also feel that many of you are feeling quite, um, what's the best way to put it, sad <sighs> about the law like of attraction, yeah. <laughs> what it's bringing you in your life. And the reality is when we are sad about uh, the law of attraction and what it's bringing us, we still have a lot of resistance to being humble. So uh, hopefully with the interviews that myself and Mary are doing over the coming weeks, we're talking more about humility and, uh, and also then after that we're hoping to talk about truth and also repentance and forgiveness about those particular things. So it should be good to see what happens. And hopefully we'll have the humility study group up and running in the next couple of weeks as well. And yeah. thanks for your interest in that. So I'm excited about that. Yeah. yeah. So it should be interesting the next yeah. few months. Yeah. 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 We love you guys. Don't give up growing in love. Eh? <laughs> yeah, Don't give up. up. My goodness. You're on the cusp of greatness. <laughs> but don't do it for that reason. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well, greatness is not really how you think it is right now. Greatness is in a far more rewarding way than... We, we often reflect upon how, um, how similar things happen compared to what happened in the first century at times, you know. And um, we also see that many of you are afraid of... Well, you, you don't understand yet the the difference between yourself and and what you've learned now in comparison to the average person on the planet. And I'm not saying this to inflate your opinion of yourself. I'm just saying as a comparison, it's important to understand that you have things you can already share with the world and there are plenty of people around us in our current environment who are open to being shared with as long as they don't feel judged or they don't feel that your condition is arrogant. And, and so, you know, the reality is there's so much we can do just from our own example in terms of teaching other people. Um, and many of you have a desire to do that, but you're not engaging that because you, you're waiting for some undetermined or indeterminate time in the future where you feel like you'll be ready to do that. Or... Some of you believe that because I, I, I might be able to do it better than yourself at the moment and answer more questions, that, that, that you should leave it all up to me. But the reality is I can't help, individually cannot help, uh, more, than a, more than 20 to 50 people probably at once. So how is it going to be a, a worldwide change without your help? Yeah. And each of you is a unique soul created by God that has a unique way of expressing these truths and sharing yourself. And people are going to respond to different people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But be humble. Be yeah. humble about your opinions, you know. You, you, you don't know everything and you know that. And you also don't really believe who I am yet, so you know that. <laughs> so just be humble about that with other people. <laughs> Do, do you know what I mean? Let, let, let yourself feel those feelings properly and be humble about it. Sometimes you feel frustrated and angry about the divine love path. So you tell people that. <laughs> you know, tell people the truth about what you feel rather than, uh, when you've got the opportunity, rather than trying to portray it to be something that it's not, you know. Yeah, we worry that people try to have a facade on the divine love path, you know. We're trying to teach you about breaking down the facade and then you create a facade of the divine love path and try to present a facade of that to the community as well. And the most beauty is in who you are and where you truly are, you know. And yeah. yeah. And just take care with, you know, blaming the community for their treatment of you when the reality is there's obviously something going on inside of us that attracts any of those kind of things. So, you know, this is where being humble is so important on the path. It, myself and Mary, when we went to Brazil, um, it was interesting because before we went, there were hundreds of people wanting to come along to the talks that we were going to give there. In one of the talks that we gave, there was five people. How would you feel if that happened to you? Some of relief. There's only five. I can <laughs> but if you, you know, if you, if you had paid 
$15,000 of your money, which somebody did actually do. They donated a flight to us and, a, and, and, those, and those kind of things, so somebody paid for all of that. If that had been your funds, how would you have felt? You know, most people would have felt some kind of disappointment um, and so forth. And these are all just things that we need to work our way through. Many of you feel uh, uh, that why, isn't, why aren't things growing more rapidly <coughs> if it's true? Not understanding how patient God is about all of this. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, no, those are just things I wanted to say while I had the opportunity. Um, we would we'll talk more about our trip away when we get the opportunity perhaps. But yeah, yeah. yeah. It was a great trip actually. Mm. It was really good. And it was very mixed um, response in Brazil, but um, there was a fantastic translator, a lady who's been on the Divine Love Path for two years, who's a professional translator who did most of the translating. And so we both just feel it's... There's an amazing resource now for anyone in Portuguese. Um, so it's just ready and waiting for people to to come. And ma- much of the material we presented is like the basic material mm-hmm. that most people need to understand. If, if they were, we're going to listen to 30 hours of presentation, that would be the basic material. And it's, it's a bit stilted because of the translating, but, um, but I that's think it's the basic great. material. Yeah. 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 And Mary did some more channeling while we were away as well with spirits um, about the material. So that, those channelings were pretty interesting too. So you'll get to see some of them if you haven't already. Yeah, That's part of me embracing my fears for public mediumship. As Anne and I are thinking of um, rather than having regular seminars for a little while, we might have regular um, mediumship uh, sessions where we we channel a spirit and have a discussion. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Let you guys ask questions of the spirit or ask discuss the channeling afterwards. Mm. Yeah. But it's all just an idea yet. Mm. Yeah. So we'll see what happens there too. Mm. Yeah. So how you how you all done? You feeling a bit stressed out, eh? Yeah. 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 yeah, I just feel that there's a lot of feelings of like getting exhausted with the process. And if, you, if you're not enjoying the process, then it's because of resistance. So, so be honest about the resistance. Let yourself feel the frustration and the anger and let yourself feel those emotions that have created the resistance. What, what you want badly that you're not getting Mm. and also confront fear you know like a lot of you are putting off your desires or waiting to have your desires and things and waiting till you're perfect yeah (laughs) desire brings so much joy even if it's messy (laughs) (laughs) i'm an expert at that now too (laughs) messy messiness in my desire (laughs) yeah Mm. Is there anything you want to ask us before we finish? Yeah. Do, yeah. I don't know if we. Uh, Do we, we need a mic? This? Or are no. we recording? Or? Um, well, we are, I suppose. So I suppose a bit of. Where's there? If a we mic use here? that other mic and. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel the opposite, actually, to what you were saying. I feel, for the first time, that um, I feel a real connection to God, and um, and I've been talking to God much more regularly on a daily basis, and. Yeah, when I when I make those comments, Joy, I'm not making it as a, a global blanket, comment yeah. or blanket comment, yeah. but rather the majority of the people are feeling the things that I'm stating. Okay. Yeah. You know, I'm feeling for the first time that um, um, it was I was like blown away with the fact that oh my gosh, God heard my prayer and God answered my prayer, and um, mm. and I feel that I could actually do this on my own with God, and um, albeit back. slowly. I'm a much slower learner than um, than Fred. But yeah, it's the first time I felt that. It's taken three and a half years. Yeah, um, and that's about how long it takes most people to get to the point where they feel quite sincere about wanting to do something about love. Yeah. It does take 
you know, three to four years of sincere addressing of what I would call addictive-based emotions before they get to the point where they feel quite open about addressing the issues, yeah. God's got us in this process where we're going to have to face every addiction to getting it right, doing it quick. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the interesting thing is when you're going through the addictions, it often feels like, oh, you know, where, where am I getting anywhere? But eventually you get through the, a fair majority of them and then you start feeling the changes inside of yourself. And then after that point, then you start to have some of this joy, you know, the joy of experiencing the truth and the joy of knowing it and the joy of uh, feeling it impacting upon your life and the joy of the relationship with God and discovering your soul and your soul's passions and following them and all of those kind of joys, you know. But it does take some time and it's only the people who are patient that generally uh, do, do it on earth. I feel more people will do it on earth than the first century um, because eventually they'll have some examples such as yourselves to look at. Yeah. That's very humbling. <laughs> yeah. The, the beauty, the difficulty is when you're the first group of people doing something, you're the ones that feel the most burden of it in the sense of, and also the most attack from others. You know, that's the reality. And uh, the key is to go through the process of forgiveness about attack and, um, and, and also r relieve yourself of the burden by no longer believing that you're responsible for the rest of the world. You just need to share, you know, yourself with the rest of the world. That's all. Mm. That's what I meant by, you know, when I said let your light shine among men, you know. Just be yourself with people, you know, and, and they will respond. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Renee? A hand that time. Might <laughs> <it? laughs> I just say um, I haven't been on this path for If you hold it a bit closer all. to yourself, the mic. Hello. That's yeah. it. Um, and... It's, on. it's probably been about just maybe eight, nine months, ten months or a year since I've been out here. So I started to look at all the truths and feel through, feel my way through. I can't even say I'm fully on the path, but um, and well, I have. Can I make a statement to you that's going to disappoint you? I'm not on the path. You're not on the path yet. No. no. Okay, that's no. okay. Um, it's good that you are intellectually open, though, to to understanding it. But emotionally, you are still in heavy addiction with your emotions and, and this heavy addiction prevents you from actually being on the path. So, so focus on the addiction. Focus yeah. on the anger that's within you and the underlying addictions that drive that. And, and once you do that, then you'll feel more like you're understanding everything at the soul. But, but proceed. Thanks. Well, I, I haven't actually said anything to people I know about that I'm doing this or yeah. and that's quite the opposite to me uh, when I find something I really if love. If you hold the mic closer. <laughs> when I find something I really that's love <laughs> and um, I recently shared with someone that I knew you and that you lived near me and or we I lived near you guys and um, that I've been learning some truths and that the truths are the best truths I've ever heard yeah. and um, the person I spoke to was Mm, semi-open but he had me on speaker on the phone and the person that was with him got really excited and went oh I've heard about those uh, Jesus and Mary living yeah. out there blah 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 yeah. and got on the internet straight away and started downloading your stuff yeah. so yeah. I just wanted to say that you never really know um, how going you're to going to touch people and, exactly. yeah. and I got so excited like in a day then I just got on the phone going right I'm going to tell everyone and I started <laughs> I told about three or four different people but by the time I got to the third or fourth, I realised that... It was more it wanting was them to all respond the same way as the first person. <laughs> mm, so I stopped <laughs> exactly. anyway. But yeah, it has to be a natural way of yeah, doing Yeah, that. but it's great to share the truth of what you've discovered. And it doesn't matter what the condition is. It, it, and if, as long as you're humble and you remind people that, like, uh, like I've heard a lot of stuff and I don't know... I don't know whether... The reality is most of you have yet to decide whether we're Jesus and Mary and that's fine. And the re reality is also that many of you um, love what you've heard but do find it difficult to put into practice and so say that to people. Mm. Well, I, I do, honest. I say it as mm. it is and, yeah. um, and I say it like that, I have said it like that before yeah. but I also feel that um, I've never really known 
God, like as in Jesus and much about the Bible. And, and um, I feel that no one I have ever met in my entire life knows as much as you know. So <laughs> it's like... <laughs> You must be. <laughs> That's my feeling. Like, and you know, and I've, someone gave me the most beautiful. Someone turned up at my doorstep the other day, and gave me the most beautiful Bible with gold, and it, it made me cry when I opened it up. It was mm. so beautiful, and um, and I've been reading it, and um, yeah, I remember things from a long time ago. So it's actually really beautiful. Yeah, that's why you're offered it, right? Because yeah. a lot of times uh, our childhood is very much linked with those stories and, and also there's a lot of emotions in those stories as well for many yeah. people. So, yeah, but, but don't uh, come to a conclusion that we are who we are just because of a process of elimination. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, it'll, no, it's, it's going to take more than that. No, it's, it's still a feeling. It still yeah. comes. It's a feeling. It's not a. It's yeah. To me, it feels like a feeling. Yeah, yeah, but it is a process of elimination. And and the reality <laughs> is that when the truth really strikes you, you will feel quite differently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Sandra. Hi. I'm just um, <laughs> wondering, like when you said. No, some of us could actually share the truth already. <laughs> Would we be talking from our own experiences rather than repeating what you've said? Of because course. Yes. it's so easy to read and like to listen to what you say and just repeat all that. It's so easy to do that. For me, yeah. it's just when, like when that, you, you know, uh, repeat what I say, uh, all you'll come across as is insincere. <laughs> Yes, and sometimes exactly. arrogant and judgmental. Absolutely. And not only that, it'll then uh, also help the person feel like it is a cult where you've been indoctrinated. Yeah. The reality yeah. is that so they'll feel those things. So basically you just describe your own personal journey through the whole process of yeah. what you've been through and share that with and people. And if you think about it, Sandra, you, you haven't been that happy about the path if you think about it. Like <laughs> you've had a lot of anger about yeah. it and you know there's been yeah. unloving things that you've done as yes. a result of some of the beliefs that you've had and... Just so you express all of that, you yeah. know, just be yourself. Yeah. Like there's a power in that, much, a much greater power than many of you realise mm-hmm. actually. Because mm. people, people are attracted to sincerity. They're not attracted to facade. So every time you try to act in a facade, you're not going to get very far. But if you can, if you can be honest and truthful and loving and sincere with a person and say things exactly as they are, they'll be impressed by that, right? People are always impressed by that, always. And, you know, often I I, I had this idea recently and I was going to put it on the blog sometime this week, but about hearing about the path from your hearts, from your words, because I feel like I see a lot of people trying to emulate AJ's words and I think... Oh, you know, when it comes from your heart and your soul, it comes out differently. And if I feel so many of you have changed so much since I've known you. And if you were to talk about the things that have changed in you, they might not be, oh, I totally have a relationship with God and I've received divine love and that, all that. It might be just, you know what I learned about my family is that I'm not obliged to them. Or I learned that love is not barter. Now... That's not a small truth to learn in your soul. That actually impacts on the entire way you live your life. And if it has entered your soul, you relating that to someone else, th- even that small change, has incredible power. Mm. But I see a lot of people trying to explain what they're learning or what they know they should ha- learn. But they forget about what, just as Jennifer pointed out today, the things that they have already shifted on the the growth that's already happened in their life. So I've been asking people lately to identify the three most significant truths that have changed in your life since you heard Divine Truth. So I'll be asking people on the blog this week that And it might be a simple thing like... I realise that I'm really, really angry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, when I met AJ, thought, I had no anger. You know, like. I was totally <laughs> anger free and yeah. took me a good uh, year to recognise that I was angry. And, uh, and, and that changed my life, recognising that. Yeah, it sounds yeah. funny, but it did. And I feel if you allow yourself to say and be yourselves to other people as well and and... 
the beauty of doing that is you can say, yeah, you know, there's plenty of times that I get angry with AJ in a, in a talk that <laughs> I go to. How many of you have been angry with me in something I've said, to be frank? Like, I, I don't think there's not a single person here who has not been angry with me at some point, right? Only Neil. Uh, only Neil. <laughs> yeah, probably, I don't, I've not noticed Neil angry with me, that's true. <laughs> um. <laughs> Did you leave your hand down? Was that on purpose? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, you know, I can't, I can't remember a time where you have been. But uh, there probably will be a time in the future where you... <laughs> He's saving it for later, yeah. <laughs> but, the, but, you know, you can say that to the people who you talk to. Yeah, you know, a lot of times he pisses me off <laughs> and annoys me and, and the things he talks about, just, you know, I, I, half of them I don't really get and I realise I get them two years later or whatever. Just be honest, you know, about the whole process for you. It's, it's that honesty that appeals to the hearts of others. And, and each of you do not realise that being a teacher is not about getting up and doing, you know, sitting in front of a person, a group and talking to them. Being a teacher is about this personal interaction, uh, demonstrating through your own life and being honest about your own life with other people and they will feel a great deal of appeal to that. Mm -hmm. They feel very strongly attracted to that. Mm -hmm. And that's what we'd like to encourage you to do, to, to not be afraid of, of being yourself and to state, you know, yeah, there was times when it was this and there was times when it was like that and there's been many times when I've gone to a group and I've walked away really annoyed and upset and, you know, and it's taken me months sometimes to work out why I was annoyed and upset and I didn't want to see him then and I wanted to criticise what was going on and, you know, then I've come back to it because it, there's always this sign of attraction. You, you know, these are the kind of things that have happened for many of you. So, so be, be free about uh, mentioning those things. Um, I feel if you do that, rather than just trying to portray yourself as somebody who's a diligent, <laughs> divine <laughs> lover, <laughs> as if there is such a term, yeah? <laughs> Alan? Alan, yeah. Uh, we just have a mic. Just, yeah, it, could you it, take that over, Sandra? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just be careful you. of the record. The thing there, Video. thanks. Yeah. Um, I'm excited to ask this question because I know there's more in this to, for, me, for me to feel. Just hang on a sec. Um, the battery's died. Can we just replace the battery? Um. There was one over there. Is that all right? Yeah. Not, not fully charged. Better, better than enough for 10 minutes or something, hopefully. Hello? 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 It's not oh, your no, battery. not your battery, it's that the battery. Camera battery. Yeah. So we yeah. just, we just want to make sure that we get. We're trying to, what we're trying to do lately is record everything, even discussions that we have, because uh, we find um, quite often there's a lot of things that come out in a discussion informally that people wouldn't say formally. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's just gone back to a formal discussion where everyone's. Yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that, but. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is there enough battery there for a few minutes? How long we got? Good day. Go ahead, Alan. You're Are right. we you're firing? Yep. yep. Good day. Uh, thanks. Sorry. Um, Sorry, something that's come up with me a couple of times when you talk about any subject, and there's the sort of a roundabout what the audience is doing and you'll say I noticed this and this is how many people are at the learning centre and things like that and there's a feeling that comes up with me when I've been a teacher and I've ran seminars in my own work in environmental sciences and things like that how I exaggerate the truth mm -hmm. not specifically talking about spiritual matters but just the structural things that go on in our life and I've noticed there's a few times you've said things that are an exaggeration to something it's only small things and and then I started feeling about that last week watching you on YouTube in Philadelphia talking about the learning centres over there and that and I guess the question I have to ask is um, in terms of ex excitement for me um, I've exaggerated the truth but the topic was still the truth and can I ask you how you feel I exaggerated the learning centres uh, yeah, sure. Um, um, 
Well, I guess you, you're excited like me, I don't know, but you'll comment, um, that the, the numbers of the learning teams in here in Australia, you mentioned that there's 40, 50 or 60 people. And the truth is there have been teams of that size, but they're not all those teams. And you I mentioned, agree. Yeah. 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 And you mentioned... So how did I exaggerate? I, uh, the you mediumship said, team was 50 or 70 people. The, the arts team, at the moment we have uh, 70 people on the team. The, so how have I exaggerated? Well, I guess um, some teams that I've been to, yep. out of all of the teams, I haven't been to all of the teams, yep. I haven't seen those numbers as yep. a, on a consistent level. I and, agree. And a lot, of, a lot of them are dropped off because they've got issues that have come up, which you've pointed out, which is another truth, yeah. and they've gone and retreated to try and look at what is their pure desire and stuff I like agree. that. Yeah. But so that doesn't mean that the team size isn't that size. Well, I guess they're not active all the time, but yeah, that's true. It doesn't mean it's not yeah. if they come back. Yeah. It's, a, it's the same way, like in, in Philadelphia, I gave a talk about, uh, I was talking about denial with a group there, and we talked about abortion. And I mentioned that there are... Um, I think I said 50 million abortions in the North American continent every year, right? Now, most people went away and said, that's far too many. So they went away and they had a look and uh, on the internet it says there are 1.2 million abortions in America, not in the whole of North American continent, but in America every year. And so they emailed to me and told me that I had exaggerated. Does that make sense? And, and I said, well, hang on a sec. This is your statistical viewpoint of what an abortion is. What an abortion actually is, is a, present, is a preventing of a child from getting to the state where they are born after a pregnancy. And if you actually analyse all of the pregnancies that occur, that are terminated within one day of the pregnancy occurring through, through contraception, you will actually find that there are around 50 million children can, who are dying every single year just in the North American continent, 250 million around the world every single year from abortive contraceptives. So my perspective is not a perspective based around what's happening on the earth, but rather a perspective that's happening in the spirit world. Yeah. So I see, for example, in the arts team, mediumship teams, there are literally hundreds of people in these teams now um, who are participating in some way, whether that way is remotely via the internet... The mailing list. ..or the mailing list or face-to-face. Um, or, or -face. Yeah. Um, just because you see a face-to-face -face presentation, you do not know what's happening behind the scenes unless you're the person who's actually involved with that team. Yeah, you and understand? that was one of the questions I had to ask you to get mm. clar clarify on that. But and can you see how perspective, Alan, yeah. is very skewed based on the personal experience? Do, do you see you don't – because you don't see the whole thing, yeah. you're only seeing what you engage. Yeah. And then you believe that to be the whole thing. Yeah, and I've had this issue with myself where I'll, I'll – it's like I'll just round it up and I'll just blurt out something to add to the truth that could be the truth – but it's not really knowing what the totality is. Like I haven't, where you have, you, you know where the other variables are. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. And, and it's I, not just that, it's also that uh, um, the reality is there's also a lot of spirit involvement in what's happening in the teams as well. If we added up everything, it'd sure. be far more in excess than what I've actually explained. Yeah. Do you understand? Yeah, sure. But, but I'm, not, I'm adding up only what's occurring on the earth. Uh, but I'm adding it from a from the perspective of a spirit looking at it on the earth, yep. not from your perspective. Yeah the, yeah. the other thing that I do too is I'm constantly examining the underlying conditions. So, so for example, many of you believe you don't have emotions that you actually have. For example, so when I say, "Ah, oh, there's a large amount of anger in the room." Right. Now, hardly any of you might be feeling that. So you say, oh, I don't feel angry. They don't feel... But the reality is that there is this anger, does, does that make sense, that is present inside that's being denied. And so, you know, unfortunately, you're going to have to allow yourself to either allow the fact that I might have made a mistake or that I might have purposefully, you know, inflated something to make it appear good. 
but does that seem to be what I normally do? Oh, not at all. No. <laughs> so, so if that doesn't appear what I normally do, then, then these times where there seemingly is some kind of discrepancy, perhaps you don't know the entire truth of what's happening. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I'm also seeing more so, and this is why I brought it up, where my error lies in judgment, one, and another one where when I'm excited about telling somebody about truth, divine truth, or any truth, that there's a tendency, tendency for me to exaggerate that. Nowhere near as much as I used to before I met you. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Yeah. But there's still a bit more to go. Yeah. yeah. I get, there's like a child that gets, there's another thing there that the excitement is that, oh, and this happened too. And then later on I'll walk away and go, actually, that didn't actually happen. So what's going on there? Yeah. So. Yeah. No, I understand. I understand the question. And, and you know, the, the reality is that there are, um, there are a lot of things going on that the majority of you never see. Um, that's the, the truth. Um, we get to, if, if, if the majority of you had actually been involved as a fly on the wall in our lives, you would be far more convinced of the truth than you currently are. But because you don't get to see those things, we don't share everything. That, and in fact, we don't, we don't generally only share it if there's a desire for, for a share, for, for it to be occur. And also there's a lot of things that we do that, have, that we do not record or do not present or, you know, that, that, that actually happen as well. Where, where millions and millions of spirits are involved in, in interactions with us. And we don't share all of those things, um, but there is a lot more going on than most people realise. Now, of course, um, it's easy to make an assessment based on what you see um, in the particular day you see it, but what we have is a much more, uh, you know, great, bigger overview of what's really going on with everyone. Yep. And, uh, and you don't have to trust that. Um, but sooner or later you'll see see that, yeah. Well, thanks, AJ. Yeah, pleasure. Um. Um, I don't know whether it was stepping out of arrogance and going into humility for a moment when I came to the realisation that I had to accept that my view of everything was very limited and very blinkered and... Um, but um, one of the things that I was attracted to with you initially was that your view was 360 degrees compared to my view. And, um, yeah, and I appreciate that greatly. Mm. It took me a while to get to that stage, though. Yeah, it takes a long time generally for someone to see that because, it, you know, I appear normal is the best way to put it. And so, therefore, um, somebody cannot see the things that I, that I see and they don't believe that I see them either. Does that make sense? And so it's only when they begin interacting in some kind of thing where I start talking about their emotions and they're crying and then they realise there's heaps of things that I can see and feel that they're not actually seeing and feeling. Does that make sense? But, but if that happens on a personal level, then people start to understand. But if it doesn't happen on a personal level, then they don't believe that I know what I'm talking about a lot of the times. And I, and I understand that. You know, that's, that's a, that is a... You know, something that is generally a problem with the hum humanity that we, we, when we see somebody who's down to earth, who's very basic, as I am, very, uh, what would you say? Aussie. <laughs> yeah, ba basically, like very, very Aussie in my presentation and so forth, then lots of judgments come. Like, I, you know, as you can imagine, we get many, many emails, um, far less now than we did when we had uh, some of the... Uh, newspaper reports going but we get lots and lots of stuff still um, emailed to us privately and also via the uh, um, via the office email accounts of you know where people just want to criticize because they don't understand what's what's happening yeah going back also to what um, previous um, speaker was saying was that um, I used to have this theory and <laughs> that was a total facade but it was don't ever spoil a good story with fact. <laughs> so always elaborate on it. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I do get my stories mixed up a bit, as Mary knows, in the sense that um, sometimes it's rare now, but um, in the past I have um, gotten 
like a story mixed up because uh, because there's all this stuff happening in the spirit world with that story as well and it's then there's all these things to recall with a story and um, but it's rare for me to do that now mm. um, it was just sort of earlier days when I when I when I did that but uh, yeah it's pretty rare nowadays Mary Mary is the opposite you have the opposite I was going to say that I I will underestimate everything, everything. I tell you <laughs> I, apart from that's my soul damage, <laughs> but maybe I even do that too. But, um, you know, uh, there was 30 of us at book group today. Like, that would be my tendency because so I don't ever us, want to over-exaggerate. How many exaggerate. of us are at book group yeah. today? I don't know. Did anyone count? I don't know. Three, four, five, six. So I reckon it's better yeah. to say 30 than 60, you know? There's, but over, that's there's over 40, injury. right? Yeah. yeah. There's over 40. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Whereas Mary would say 30. Yeah. But that's about that's about my childhood, you know, and not being um, I don't know, not talking yourself up. That's I have a big uh, injury about that, you know, from my parents. You should never be self-promoting, and I would even say that by saying that there were seventy people at book group, that's self-promote. That's how big the injury is in me, you know. You the reality is, there's like twenty-five thousand people plus at book group. <laughs> Yeah. So, how does that make you feel, Mary? Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I don't think about Mary, that Mary, much. <laughs> Mary wants to completely sort of remain blind to the other, you know, 24,960 <laughs> <laughs> who are here. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not the spirits, yes, is that? Yes, it is the spirits. Yeah, no, it is the spirits, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, you know, the, the, the issue often is that we don't see a complete picture of what we're looking at at all. And uh, we need to, to, to see a complete picture. There's all sorts of emotions that have to be released to see a complete picture. Yeah. Yeah. Kelly? Uh, I definitely can't see everything at this point, but um, I've had laws of attraction with people who have come to to the talks in the last couple of years, and I've bumped into them down the coast. And um, you know, there's a bit of a you know, there's anger towards you, and there was the comment that um, oh, you know, AJ just deflects everything back, and um, you know, stating that they know what you do, and um, I just said, we, you know, we could never, I could never sit and assume what you do to own your emotions and your humility. We could not sit here and assume that you and Mary are, are not doing that. Mm. And um, they're like, mm. yeah. 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 <laughs> the reality is no we get attacked very frequently, as you can imagine, and uh, we have to go through our own emotional experience about that. Um, you know... I think it was just yesterday that Mary got a couple of emails that was sexual, sexually violent, you know, that we, she had to work her way through, you know, and um, this, these kind of things happen on a regular basis. So, so you know, but we, the difference is that we own everything and we don't feel the need to explain everything about um, what we're going through to you so that you can share emotionally in the experience or have any sense of commiseration for us. And in fact, uh, what we prefer to do is to work through our stuff by ourselves and we encourage all of you to do the same thing, actually, to work through your stuff by yourself without needing the commiseration or support of other people. Because if you do that, you'll actually get closer to God very rapidly because in the end you'll want that relationship as the primary one. Um, and I think people um, often when they raise something in a talk, AJ will point out to them the issue that they're being very unloving in the way that they raise. Very separate to the way that Alan just raised an issue. Like you could feel yeah. there's absolutely no projection. He's like, I, I just have this issue and I want to know. Yeah. That is so rare to happen. And so it would be remiss not to point that out really if we're here to talk about love and most times people are raising issues that are reflecting something about themselves which also would need to be said. So most but of what a person uh, you know attacks me about 
uh, is about themselves really. Like, you know, if, if they feel they can't trust me, a lot of times it's got nothing to do with whether I'm trustworthy or not. Mm. You know, it's got everything to do with whether they, whether they think anybody is trustworthy, to be frank. Uh, uh, yeah, mm. and I suppose what I observe is that when people sincerely want to understand a discrepancy or something that they see within AJ, then I, I observe him explaining it very, very openly. And I also observe him processing, uh, being humble to your own emotions and mm. recognising when you have an issue of an error within you and not many people get to see that because they don't live with him um yeah hmm. yeah but yeah go ahead yeah so like i feel i feel a lot of people's like if you think of the underlying basis of the teachings if a person is angry with me then they are already not understanding the truth about love and they're also not only understanding the truth about their own emotions anger is the result of an addiction inside of them not being met I don't get angry with them when they attack me. People that attack me and condescending me, even in my own groups, like we pay for the venue, they sit in a seat that I've paid for and then they attack me and I'm still humble enough to take the attack without attacking them back, right? And many of them don't consider that, right? That the fact that they are sitting in a chair I paid for, in a hall that I paid for, you know, because a lot of this money comes out of our own account. Uh, sure, it comes from donations eventually, but but we've had to pay for it up front, like a lot of it. And so so we've we've done all of that. We've given them the gift of all of that, and then they believe they can sit in an audience and attack me, and they can still do that, and I don't react angrily. Mm. Like, they don't go, well, that's pretty unusual. Like... <laughs> I'm sitting in a free seminar with the ability to attack the presenter without him reacting in an angry manner back to me. If they considered that, and then they considered their own rage towards me when all I've ever done is given them things for free, then they'd have, to some, they'd have some level of comparison perhaps of the lack of love or in comparison to where, where love really is. And what I find quite frequently is people don't measure things by love. They have other things to measure it by, addiction primarily. So if I don't meet a person's addiction, then of course they get angry. And that's, uh, that comes with the territory. Look at how many people in the first century were angry with me. Half of my disciples were angry with me most of the time in the first century. Like they used to, there's records in the Bible of them being angry with me. All right? And then I died because of people's angry, anger with me. You know, they were angry with me most of the time. Why do you think that was? So to me, to me uh, somebody being angry with me is, is a sign that I'm not meeting their addictions in the manner that they want me to. It doesn't necessarily mean that I've done the wrong thing by a person. The thing that I do is I analyse my feelings for the person. If my feelings are a feelings of love, still, no matter how they treat me, then the issue is not, for me, an issue of whether I've, you know, done something wrong. It's an issue of whether I'm lo I've been loving or not. And uh, the majority of times when I analyse the situation, I've been completely loving to them, and at the same time they've been completely attacking to me, eh? and they still believe that I'm the person who's being unloving. Yeah. Mm. And I haven't attacked them, I haven't, you know, I haven't been angry with them. I, you know, the, there's people who have become angry with one event of me exposing something in them that for the last three or four years they've be, just had an internet hate campaign. And I go, oh, okay, this is very interesting. This demonstrates to me, like I haven't got an internet hate cam campaign against them so where's the love and at some point somebody will say yeah actually no the way AJ's treated that person is more loving than the way that that person is treating AJ does that make sense yeah but what about a third party angry with you AJ do you feel that yeah of course I feel yeah. any person who's angry with me I've had a case um, this week. It's obviously been, it's been brewing for a while. I didn't really realise it had been brewing to the extent um, that a person had um, uh, feelings for me but resents you because 
believes that your teachings and you have taken my affections, which they weren't there, to, towards that person away. Yes. And they're, you know, with you and this path and... Yeah, so most... So that person's very resentful to you because of it. Yeah, most people who attack us actually have some kind of family or, or friendship addiction with people uh, who... And they believe that my words or, you know, my teachings have somehow interfered with their relationship. And, and because they don't want to feel their own emotions they haven't got the humility to feel their own emotions, they would prefer to attack me than realise what's going on. And I understand it's not um, the person not wanting to feel their emotions, but since that happened, on my right foot, on my heel, it's painful. I can hardly walk on it. So I'm obviously holding some emotions attached with it as well. Certainly, yeah. certainly. And, and I, like the way I see it many times is that we are unwilling to speak about issues of truth with others that could... could have a major impact upon them seeing the truth. You know, mo many of us have still got a large amount of fear associated with speaking truth. So, so we avoid speaking truth when we have the opportunity and we don't understand what we're creating because every time we avoid speaking the truth when the opportunity is given to us, we are in fact creating a negative event. And that's, this will actually contribute to the, to the misunderstandings about divine truth on the planet, not, not the understanding of it. We, we think we're avoiding a painful situation, but the reality is in our avoidance we are allowing the untruth to remain. And one thing you'll notice from my own example is that I never allow the untruth to remain. Right? And once uh, I feel many of you learn to not do the same thing, you'll find that the spread of divine truth will just rapidly improve because it's our allowing untruth to remain in our personal interactions with others that cause um, all sorts of issues and problems. Yeah, mm. well, my law of attraction's brought two different ones to me just this week. So. Exactly. <laughs> with yeah. men, Barb. Hey? With yeah, men. And both with yeah. men, yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we, you know, we often allow untruth to remain with a specific gender because of our emotional investments with that particular agenda. So, um, you know, that's something to look at. But, but like the way I see it is that if we were all very open about the truth and very, f very open when we're given the opportunity to express uh, things about the truth, not forceful and not, you know, not demanding or anything, but just open, then people would actually respond much more willingly and rapidly, you know. Um, and also we need to look at our own, like many people have, many people on, who, who think they're on the path has, have used me as an excuse to break up a relationship or have used my teachings as an excuse to break up the relationship. And, and of course, the person on the receiving end of that is going to walk away feeling that I am to blame. But in a sense, that person wanted that. Because <laughs> they wanted to avoid the, the actual confrontation for themselves. That, how else? So many people blame me for the breakup of a relationship and they like other people being angry with me because it helps them to not be angry with them. Do you understand? So there are many people on the divine love path who think they're on the path who avoid truth and allow people to believe things about me because it's preferable than allowing the same people to believe bad things about them personally. And so what they do is they allow people to believe the untruth in personal situations because that way they get to avoid their anger and rage of that individual towards themselves rather than towards me. They would prefer to see people angry with me than they would for the same person to be angry with them. Mm. Does that make sense? It makes sense. Um, I I don't believe that was my case. I was thought I was. I'm being telling you that it is your case. Oh no! <laughs> the issue that you have with a, a oh. fellow on the on oh, the yes. Gold Coast. That one definitely. You're yes. perfectly happy for him to be angry with me. Yeah, I, I wasn't aware that he was angry with you until you pointed it out to no, me. No, that's right. That's how detuned you are from your interrelationship with him. Mm. You can't see his rage with me, and I've felt it for, for the last year and a half. Mm. And, and this is what I'm saying, is that you would prefer him to be angry with me than you would be to speak the truth and him be angry with you. Mm. And this is why you avoid mm. telling him the truth and, and him getting angry with you instead. Mm. Does that make sense? Oh, yes, I definitely do So it's much more preferable anger. for you 
to 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 actually have his anger directed at me than it is for you then to be the uh, the the recipient of his rage. Mm. Yeah, mm. and and it's interesting. I bring up the example as a generalisation. You do not see it. <laughs> And so now I have to bring up the example as a specific thing. I was talking about the second male, not the first male. I know what you male. were talking about. <laughs> but <laughs> if you think about it, like if, it, if that was me in that example and if I thought, wow, yeah. the law of attraction has brought me two men, very similar situation, like in terms of their feelings. They're both, I prefer one to be angry with AJ than me. The other one is angry with AJ even though… Rather than me. Rather than me. And yet it's my feelings. Yeah. So I, I don't, I'm not interested in him. I would have to look at that my, if it was me and go, oh, okay, maybe I need to be I must honest. prefer that yeah. he's angry with AJ. And the reality is you do personally prefer that people are angry with me rather than angry with you. Mm. And the reality is the majority of us do. <laughs> mm. you, you, majority of us are completely okay with the person being angry with someone else other than me. <laughs> if we think of it from a personal point of view. So, so, you know, this is how we can actually be in relationships with people who are angry. As long as they're not angry with us, we're okay. And that, how unjust is that? Re the reality is if we looked at it from the perspective of love, the way, they should be, the way they're treating that other person is the way they should be treating us. So if they're treating the other person angrily and they're treating us nicely, there's a problem with the person from a perspective of love. And I would never be able to live with a person who's treating another person angrily while at the same time they're treating me nicely without saying something. But, but we do because we're avoiding the rage coming at us. Mm -hmm. So we have an emotional investment in the personal acceptance of rage. We do not want to accept personally the rage. We want it to be directed towards somebody else. Yeah? And that's an issue of truth. And it's also an issue of love and it's also an issue of humility. And it's also <laughs> like there's so many issues involved with that one. That one thing, thank mm. you. <laughs> yeah. So, so these are areas where you know, we often don't see what we're doing. We, we, uh, we allow things to continue because of our emotional investment. Our emotional addiction to, to be loved all the time means that we have an addiction in the sense that anybody who's angry, we just hope they're not angry with us. <laughs> and if they're angry with someone else, we're okay with that. Yes, I must admit in my family, our large family, my father was often angry and it wasn't directed at me and I was quite happy. Exactly. Mm -hmm. whereas, yeah. whereas the reality is if we were actually in a state of love, whoever he's angry with in the family, we would have stood up for that. Does that make sense? As a principle of, As a principle truth, and of love, truth and yeah. love. Yeah. We would have said, no, even though it's not me, I can't agree with this behaviour. Does that make sense? This is how many women live with violent men. This is also how many women live with men who are violent towards the uh, children. Because as long as it's not happening to them, they're okay. Well, I was going to say, part of my old criteria for a relationship was a man who was angry but not with me. Because <laughs> then I'd feel safe. You know, some of us seek out people who are angry because we're so personally, physically afraid. Yeah. yeah. But the, of course, the irony is then we end up with a man who's potentially violent and angry. You'd be amazed at how many emails I get from your friends who have been friends of yours in the past attacking me because of your behaviour. Mm hmm and I haven't stated any of it to you till now because I feel about that. I feel about the feeling of injustice that you're not willing to stand up for truth with these people and that I finish up getting the brunt of it. Do you understand? So I feel about that rather than blaming you for it. Mm. Of course, yeah, yeah, of course. There are many spirits who come to me who would try to attack me as a direct result of your behaviour, your unwillingness to release an addiction or whatever. Yep, certainly. And well, even, even spirits or people that you haven't known. Yes, I've had spirits of people who, um, who have just heard over the internet something that I've said about spirit attachment 
and those spirits with the person who's read the material have come and attacked me because of the breakdown of the relationship with that person as a result of my words. And I don't even know the person. Does that make sense? But that if you think about it, these are the kind of issues that a lot of us avoid. This is the reasons why we avoid standing up for truth and st- speaking about not just divine truth but just truth uh, in terms of integrity is the fear of being attacked. And, and yet if we're really humble, we will feel about that. And if we really are, do have integrity, we'll do that in our, in our day-to-day lives. Mm. Um, regardless of divine truth, if, if we have integrity, we stand up for truth and love. So and, it, and it's immaterial with who it is. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's Jesus or a little child or anybody else, we'll still stand up for truth and love. We stand up for truth and love even, even when it means something happens to us. We still stand up for truth and love, even if it means we're going to be attacked, even if it means we're going to be violently abused, even if it means we're going to be killed, we stand up for truth and love. That's the level of desire you need to eventually have to be at one with God, mm-hmm. to stand up for truth and love. Yeah. It's also why when a person lives in fear rather than confronts it, they'll never be a trustworthy person because they'll always honour the fear rather than truth and love. They'll yeah. always compromise integrity at some point. Mm. Yeah. Once you are willing to make that stand and confront fear, then suddenly you become a far more trustworthy person. So if you get to a stage where you're no longer fear, you, you're no longer willing to listen to your fear and you're willing to speak about truth and love whenever the opportunity arises, once you get to that point, you are no longer dictated by fear. So even though you have fear in you, you still might have fear in you, but you're no longer dictated to by it. Your, your actions are not dependent upon it anymore. Once you get to that point, and then you then you stand up for truth and you stand up for love when you need to and when you do that th- that gives everyone around you the ability to respond to that i convinced myself aj that that's what i was doing but i was only obviously doing it when it suited myself to do it yes not all the time. and in particular if you look at it uh, it's you are only doing it when there was no potential of you being attacked you see many of us stand up for truth and love with the people who we know are not going to attack us. Mm -hmm. But when with the people who we know are going to attack us, what do we do then? Breathe. You know, we withdraw. Yeah. 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 Um, Jen? Yeah. And then Joy and... Feel free to leave if you want to leave. What if we still, like, keep getting attacked... If you still get, keep getting attacked, then there's an emotion inside of yourself that's causing this attack. So, so my suggestion is to do what I've had to do, and that is work my way through the emotional issues as to why it occurs. Obviously, though, um, it depends on your response to the attack. So, so once you've worked through the emotion, you will no longer feel hurt by the attack. Does that make sense? The fact that we're hurt by the attack is an indication that there's an emotional something going on emotionally inside of us that we're not allowing ourselves to grieve. It feels just like terror. Is, I don't, it doesn't feel like hurt so much, but terror is what comes up for me. Mm. Mm-hmm. And so this is like things like a deep fear of your own life, a deep fear of the loss of your own life, a deep fear of being hurt or physically violently hurt, a deep fear of personal physical pain, a deep fear, you know what I mean? Like... There, we have many fears and we need to just allow the situation to trigger these fears and, and be soft mm. to the experience of it. Okay. And I believe the truth is then, and I'm saying I believe it is because I, I haven't really experienced that yet in this life, <laughs> but that once we do that, we'll reach a state of forgiveness and then it won't affect us when attack happens, you know. Yeah. But until then, we haven't really forgiven, you know. Yeah. So at any one point in time, I've currently got millions of people attacking me, um, even during this discussion, and, and like I have to become more soft to that attack. Um, I have to go through the process of forgiving that attack. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Uh, Joy had a hand up, yeah, and then <coughs> Renee, then Karen. Yeah. 
Just the conversation you were having about truth and love and Barb shared with me something that you'd said to her <coughs> which made me realise how important it is for us, <coughs> for our own progression but also if we really want to serve God and help share divine truth with the world that, um, that not being willing to stand up for truth and love as the disciples were in the first century is what really caused the loss of the truth to the earth and look where that's taken us in 2,000 years. And so... Um, Can I correct that a little bit, yes. though, Joy? The, the reality is that many of the disciples did stand up for truth and love, but only after I died. So the, after I died, they had large amounts of grief that they experienced, and then after they experienced that grief, they realised that it now relied on them as to what truth there would be on the planet. And once they took up that role and like that process of oh this is me i need to be truth and love which is something they could have done before my death but chose not to do um and we just we in fact myself and mary talked to our spirit friends yesterday many of about them this. Uh, ab about this because um many of them have deep regrets still that that they never um responded by acting in harmony with truth and love while I was alive. And they actually could see that because of their unwillingness to do that, there was a it had a large effect on my passing, actually. That, that it actually caused a lot of my death. Like a lot of the causes, the underlying causes were related to this. And so, you know, that's something that many of you have yet to understand, that, that every time you act out of harmony with truth and love or you don't take the opportunity to speak up for truth and love and you don't take the opportunity to be loving and truthful in any situation, you're actually... Um, there are a number of different things that are occurring. Um, one of which is that instead of seeing a group of people who are harmonious with truth and love, the spirits around you only see me. So, they, so I become the focal point of attack. Does that make sense? Now, you imagine if there's like a thousand people who are all speaking up for truth and love, and there's more than a thousand people, there's like tens of thousands of people who have heard the divine truth. If there were a thousand people speaking up for truth and love, it would be pretty hard to stop the people from telling the truth, wouldn't it? But if there's one person speaking up for truth and love, what are you going to do if you're against it? You just attack that person, attack that person, attack that person until that person gives up or the person dies or the person or something happens to the person and then you've won. So you don't realise actually that a lot of the future of divine truth on the planet relies upon each of you getting to the state where you're willing to speak up for love and truth in any situation without uh, consideration of your own personal welfare doing it. Yeah. Mm. But that's also, that's not just the, what the progression of divine truth on the planet depends on, that's your own your progression soul depends progression on that. depends on actually. actually yeah. yeah. And many of my, our spirit friends from the first century, um, you know, they didn't realise that until they passed. They didn't realise the effect of all of their choices and decisions until they actually passed. And uh, what would be lovely if many of you could have realised the effects of these decisions before you pass and then you won't experience the same regrets that they have. Um, the, the reality is after I passed, they, they went into a state of more love and truth and, and as a result, um, the, Christ, the so-called Christian religion became a, a fairly large teaching. Of course, it got heavily distorted in a very short period of time, but... but but it became a worldwide phenomenon because of their effort after I passed. Does that make sense? Their desire to stay in harmony with truth and love after I passed. Mary's desire to do the same after I passed is what created the worldwide phenomenon, which is now known as Christianity. Mm. So it had nothing to do with me. I was already passed. <laughs> Had a fair bit to do with you, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, it would have been nice if I stayed on Earth. And but, but the reality is that um, a lot of they, a lot of the disciples didn't know what they were creating by their avoidance of love and truth in their own lives. Yeah.
Mm. It's much easier for a hundred people to stay in harmony with love and truth than it is for one. Mm -hmm. You know that in your personal life, right? You know what it's like in your family. If you're the only person sticking up for love and truth in your family and the rest of the family don't want to know the truth and they don't want to love, how hard it is, it is it to stay in harmony with love and truth in the family? Pretty hard. Uh, you know that. We'll multiply that by every person in the community, every person in the environment, all the spirits. <laughs> can you see, like, uh, uh, if we can learn to stick in and uh, be in this place of love and truth with every single person in every single interaction, then you can see the huge positive effect it's going to have to every single person around me. Yeah. Mm. Mm. It was Renee next one. Yeah, Renee, then Karen. Just about um, <laughs> the... Um, about not being on the past, what you just said before about mm -hmm. the anger, um, being... It, what did you mean? <laughs> well, see, now you are actually being selfish. Am I? Because okay. you're asking a personal question okay. in an audience of 30 people. Okay. This is now about 30 people right. here. I right? just feel like it's a bit here. I've just been <laughs> trying to work it out a bit and... I not know you're trying to work it out, it but you're not, you heart. want me to give you an answer. But this is now a very selfish question and you're not seeing the selfishness of it. Because now what you're doing is you're asking a specific personal question that the rest of the individuals must share in. Does that make sense? If I engage this with you, I am forcing the rest of the audience now to engage in this very personal interaction with Renee. Does that make sense? Definitely. It would be much better if you could sit with what I've said to you and ponder about the basic underlying principles of divine truth which include humility, truth and love and particularly humility. And if you listened to the talks about humility in particular and then ask yourself the question, am I in that place? Because the reality is you're not in that place. You're in a place of heavy addiction. But I stated very clearly to you that in my last answer to you. That's the question you're asking about the, about what he meant when he said that to you about mm. the addiction and the anger. No, he didn't say addiction. Not that no, I, I did. Yeah. Oh, there you go. You I didn't did hear that. <laughs> yeah. And this is the thing. I did say it, but you didn't hear it. See, oh. see, your perception is skewed already because you don't want to hear that you're in addiction. Yeah, I know. I know. Right? So yeah. my suggestion is to, if we have a tape of this or something that. You re-listen to it, but you'll see that I actually stated that it's to do with the addictions that you're in, and and yet you skipped over that completely, and that and that is the actual thing that causes you to stay off the path. Does that mean off the way, the way to God? If if you think about it, every time I'm in my addictions, and you are deeply desirous of all of your addictions, particularly with men being met, and as a result of that. You cannot be on the path. You ha can only get on the path when you're willing to confront these addictions and start to feel the underlying emotions. Does that make sense? Yes. Other than that, you're just exactly the same as any other person who's ever heard any truth in the world in the, in the sense that you, you are all you are doing in that particular moment is doing the same as everybody else on the planet, wanting my addictions met without looking at them. Yeah, and you're very happy to do that at this point in time. Mm. And what I'm suggesting to you is stop doing that yeah. and examine them more closely. Feel the demand coming out of you because it's very, very strong. Yeah. Yeah. All right. It'll be great for you. You, you don't realise how good it's going to be. <laughs> great. Yeah, it will be. <laughs> That's what I want to <laughs> Eventually, I don't know. When, but you've been but very resistive to that. So any time we speak about addictions, it's like you can't even hear the word addiction. <laughs> it's funny on the um, those um, scripts. The, that was the one that I chose to work on, yeah. and I still haven't like really started it off. And every time I go, "Yep, that's the one I've got to work on." I know it's the one I've got to work on. Yeah, and you're getting plenty of promptings to do so by your spirit friends. Yeah. Um, they're pretty easily able to prompt you, but you're very resistive to it at the moment. Yeah. So ask yourself why. Because yeah. I just heard you say anger and emotions and intellect. I just heard those three words. I know. You didn't hear me discussing the crux of it, which is the addiction. <laughs> <laughs> we go to Karen behind Thank you. you. Mm. I, I, I think I... I'm much more careful about speaking the truth now because I think before, for most of the time, I um, 
wasn't speaking it from my heart and also because because I'm I'm I've lost it. I I was using it as a battering ram a little bit, you know. I when when I get uh, attack, when I feel attack, mm-hmm. I I'm, I'm usually say to myself, it's because I'm telling them something they don't want to hear, so I need I shouldn't do that. But am I kidding myself there? Yeah, well, it depends on the circumstance or situation. Uh, firstly, if uh, like if somebody in public says an untruth, um, and and uh, you know, then I will correct it. Right. Secondly, if somebody comes to my home and says an untruth, then I will definitely correct it. But if I go to, you know, the movie theatre and watch a movie or something and somebody in the movies or, or somebody next to me says an untruth, it's up to them, like, what they do. Those particular environments are not anything that I have any level of desire to... to or, or desire to um, control or, or, or any of those things. The reality is I have a responsibility when I'm in my own home to act in a, re- in a place of love and truth. I have a responsibility when I'm in a place where I'm teaching people truth or I'm wanting truth to be, you know, to be the primary guidance. I have a responsibility to tr- teach truth and love in that particular location. But, but I don't have a responsibility to teach truth and, and, and love in, this, in the sense of forcing it down people's throats or anything like that. But many times I see we become complicit in a denial of truth and love and that's something very different. The mm. minute I feel I'm complicit in something, that I'm by my inaction supporting something, yeah. then I feel I need to speak up about it. Yep. Sometimes I'm terrified and I don't, but I still feel that that would be the ethical thing to do. Yeah. 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 So I would not stand by and watch somebody abuse a child without having something to say, for example, mm. even if it's not my child. And I don't know the person. Mm. Yeah. Okay. But, I, but I'd ask him, do you feel this is loving? You know, because I don't feel this is loving. Mm. But see, mate, why don't we do that? There's only one reason. Fear. Fear. Fear is the only reason. We are afraid. That's the only reason. Mm. Yeah. See, if we come from a place of love... We won't want to push it down in somebody's throat. and We won't want to demand something of them. We're just doing it because we love. Mm. And this is where the majority of us get mixed up because we're not doing it because we love. We're not telling the truth because we love. We're telling the truth because we want to control the person. We want to boss them around. We want to manipulate them into stopping something that we feel harmed by. Or So we, we have very ulterior motives many times in telling the truth. The key is to purify your motive and still tell the truth. (laughs) Not to stop telling the truth. That's not the answer. Purify your motive and tell the truth. If you, um, we had this interaction this week with a radio program in Ireland who want to do an interview of us, and um, I was managing that and liaising with the people and. We just said, okay, right, this is the time. And I wrote to her and I said, okay, that's fine. And what's the name of the guy who will be interviewing us? And, of course, you know our stipulation that we'll be presenting this on the internet. And, yeah, yeah, that's all fine. Just our stipulation is that you don't mention the presenter's name because he's anonymous on, on air. And I went, well, okay, there's an issue here. I can't, I'll be complicit in an, in an avoidance of truth and, and love. You know, I, we believe in having a transparent life and if someone wants to be anonymous, that's okay, but I can't be on their radio station while they are. But then, then it was very interesting what happened because I sat down to write back and say this. But I have very many emotions about the media, <laughs> unresolved fears, sense, and, and also a feeling that um, my feeling was right. Well, I can't be complicit with this, but... So I'm just going to have to tell them that, and that's that. And AJ was actually coming from a position of love. And he said, well, no, Mary, are, are you going to really explain what this issue is actually about? Because if you're loving, the, the law of attraction has brought you this opportunity to, and these people are engaged with us, and now you're just basically saying, okay, no, bye. 
Um, <laughs> you know, that's really what my feeling was. All oh, right, we always get something. Okay, bye. Um, As I sort of looked at it, no, this is a great opportunity. Even if nothing else happens, this guy will understand some principles of ethics if I engage this in a loving manner and explain to him why, you know, why we have the position we have. So AJ wrote him quite a lengthy email, which I actually found confronting to read because of my familial injuries where you don't actually point out anything to anyone. He did it in a very loving way and I could logically read it and say that is loving words presented in a loving way um, and it was just speaking about what we believe but all my family stuff came up about, you know, preaching and even though they engaged us, we didn't seek them out and this is what happened. Anyway, the guy wrote back and he said, Oh, you had two exchanges with him, didn't you? He yeah, we said, had a second exchange yeah. where he basically misconstrued some of my words and so thought, forth. Thought that it was, you know, that, that we I'd had some problem or whatever. And AJ wrote back again with this spirit of love. It was really love. I was going through all the stuff. He was like, da 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 da. Anyway, the guy came back and said, no worries. I've never been named on air before, but if you'd like to name me, this is my name and uh, we're going ahead with the interview. So that was a huge lesson for me, but I, I, had the, I could identify the issue of truth and love immediately for myself, but because I wasn't humble to everything that was being brought up, I couldn't present the truth back in a really loving way. AJ could in an effortless way and I saw how it panned out. I'm sure if I had have sent my email, which wasn't nasty, it was just saying, look, I'm sorry, we can't support that, you know, thanks for your time. This is, I said briefly, we, you know, we believe in transparency and we just would be complicit with something, you know, the end, bye. <laughs> AJ wrote about we believe in humility, truth and love and really explained and it. I explained what each one of those things were and... And then, then I talked about the situation he was asking us to engage in and how it wasn't loving or truthful or humble. And, uh, and he misconstrued a few of those things, so he emailed back. But we started an engagement, right, which was great. And he was and, very respectful. And he was so. very respectful in the engagement as well. And so I engaged him back again and explained in more detail, um, you know, what, what was going on with those particular things. So in that process, he at least got some exposure to truth and love in a personal interaction and and he, he learned something in that process, you know. And he also, as a result of that, felt far more intrigued about having a further discussion, which, uh, um, which, which will be beneficial for our actual discussion that we have on air. He, he, he's put an hour aside on air, uh, which is pretty unusual. It's a talkback radio show, so it should be quite interesting. And, um, it's usual for him, we should say. He yeah, has a regular hour, but it's, but it's unusual, unusual for, us. for us to get an hour on <laughs> Normally on we get air. two minutes. You yeah. say you're Jesus, yes, well, you're ha -ha. stupid. Ha -ha. Yeah. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> you know, that's the normal radio show. Uh, so. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the one we did in, Mel in Melbourne was the guy made fun of us, and I was, AJ couldn't stop laughing. He, uh, and so I was talking. And <laughs> It was so funny, I couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> Didn't get much out that time. <laughs> but, uh, but if you engage a situation as it truly is, like, um, then, you know, what you finish up happening is you create a whole he heap of things in harmony with God's laws. We, d we don't understand the power of this, you know. It's like when you, when you pander to the emotion and don't conf confront the truth or love in the, in the interaction... You are you are automatically uh, now constrained by a heap of laws that are working against you. Like I, my feelings are, no, this is a great opportunity to engage those laws, and then you know also trust that eventually somebody who is in a har harmonious state will respond to that. Yeah, mm. in the past we've compromised uh, sometimes on issues with the media, and as a result got. We got hammered anyway, and then. Uh, but it, but but there's also the compromise. You walk away from the f thing feeling much worse because you've mm. compromised. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, okay, we should must go. be time for dinner, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well and truly. Yeah. Thanks, you guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. So we'll catch you. We'll catch you next week.
next Thursday, next yeah? Thursday. Three o'clock.